These budgets have been cut so much that schools are depending on basically selling these kids junk food to keep programs that we all care about uh, alive. So there's a real, you know, tense conflict there. Hi, everyone. Just wanted to let you know that this episode contains some colorful language. So if you're listening with kids, you might want to save this episode for later. Welcome to the Doctor's Pharmacy. I'm Dr. Mark Hyman, and that's Pharmacy with an F, F F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, a place for conversations that matter. If you care about our food system and want to know the inside scoop from Washington and what happens and what doesn't happen, you're going to love this podcast because it's with my friend, Sam Cass, who's the former senior policy advisor for nutrition in the Obama administration, and he was also the executive director of Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign and the Obama family chef. He's currently a partner in Acre Venture Partners. Now, he kind of fell into this. Seems like he was, uh, <laughs> we had lunch recently and he was telling me how he really never went to chef school and he sort of fell into learning how to cook when he went to Europe. But he basically found his way into cooking for the Obamas in Chicago during the Obama um, uh, uh, run for president. And then, of course, he joined them in the White House Uh, and the staff in 2009. Uh, He took on lots of roles, including the chef and the residents, but also the executive director of Lady First Lady Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign. He was the senior White House policy advisor in nutrition. He's the first person in history of the White House to have a position in the executive office of the president and the residents, which is kind of cool. So he'd go from basically <laughs> the office to home and cook for them. As one of the first um, ladies' longest serving advisors, he helped the first lady create the first major vegetable garden at the White House since Eleanor Roosevelt's Victory Garden, which is interesting because a lot of people are now talking about creating gardens. And not only is toilet paper flying <laughs> off the shelves, but so are seeds and garden equipment for people who never had a garden before. Yeah. Um, Sam is now a partner at Acre Venture Partners, uh, which is a venture capital fund investing in the future of food with a mission to improve human and environmental health in the food system. What a great thing to do. Uh, The fund focuses on early stage, highly disruptive, impactful companies in the food system, focused on agriculture, supply chain, and consumers. Uh, Fast Company named Sam uh, in 2011 on their list of 100 most creative people. Uh, He also helped create the American Chef Corps in 2012, which is dedicated to promoting diplomacy through culinary initiatives. I love that. He's an MIT Media Lab Fellow and a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader and he graduated from the University of Chicago. Welcome, Sam. <laughs> There's nothing else to know about me. Uh, <laughs> well, he, he wrote a book called Eat a Little Better, Great uh, okay. Flavor, Good Health, and Better World, which there was published go. in 2018 <laughs> about his time in the White House, which is great. So wow. uh, so good to be here. Yeah, thanks, Sam. For do, thanks for doing this. This is an interesting time for all of us. We're all sequestered in our homes, trying to figure out how the world's going to look during yeah. the age of Corona and after. Um, yeah. But whatever it looks like, we're going to have to deal with this pesky issue of food in our food system because while coronavirus is killing us in the short term, in the long term, it's chronic disease. And what most people don't realize is that those who are at most risk of dying from COVID-19, the disease caused by coronavirus, are those with chronic illness, whether it's diabetes, heart disease, uh, even being overweight. I mean, if you're overweight, you're about three times more likely to die. If you're have heart disease, you're 10 times more likely to die. If you have diabetes, yeah. you're seven times more likely to die. And this is already burdening our healthcare system, which we can see now as being crippled under the weight of the coronavirus. So mm-hmm. we're going to have to deal with this. Yes, um, coronavirus is acute, but chronic disease is chronic. And unfortunately, we don't do it well with chronic things. We push them off. And it's it's like a slow moving tsunami that's coming for us uh, once this coronavirus is over. So we're going to talk about that today. Okay. And we're going to start out by talking with Sam about how he is the accidental chef. (laughs) (laughs) You you spent your first trimester in college working in one of the best restaurants abroad in Vienna. Uh, Your plan was to study a lot and cook occasionally, and you actually did the opposite. Uh, So you worked a a super hard (laughs) 10-hour shift as a tryout, and you were hooked. So how did this get you thinking about food in a different way? especially the implications of what's on our plate yeah. uh, about our farmers and our land. Yeah. Um, it was actually a very specific moment for me while I was training in Vienna. I was, um, 
I ended up staying there uh, after my semester, my final semester of, of school was done and worked there illegally for um, about a year. But very early on in that process, so that's, I got run out of town, but that's a whole <laughs> uh, But very early on in the process, um, the sous chef uh, asked me to make a rhubarb dish, a sauce to go with the dish we were making. And he, I'll clean this story up for, uh, for okay. the at home. But he basically told me, he called me Yankee, and he said, you know, Yankee, cook the, cook the rhubarb down, puree it, and then in the butter. And I was like, okay, uh, uh, all right, I'll put a ton of butter in. So I go and I do that, and I put a huge amount of butter in. And he said, no, 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 Yankee, I said, you know, mm, in the butter. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that's crazy. And so I put another huge thing in, and he came up to me pissed, and he, and he said, I said, in the butter, he said, you know, if a guest walks out of this restaurant and drops dead of a heart attack, that's not my problem. He said, oh. The guest asked me to make food that tastes good to them, not that's good for them. And, you know, it just totally rocked me, mostly because he was right. Uh, and that was true, you know, for the whole food system that we've been demanding food that tasted good, but we're not really that concerned with the well-being of the food that we were eating. Yeah. And so I went back to my station and I looked out, you could, I could see out into the dining room and I looked out and I just started thinking about what he said to me and realizing that everybody in that dining room looked terrible. Like they looked completely overweight and unhealthy. And I just started, I asked myself, well, what is the implications of what I was, you know, preparing for them to eat on their, on their lives and their well being? And then just as I was sort of in this middle of asking myself these questions, after getting chewed out by the chef, <laughs> by the way, is like the, the, the most wonderful human. I love that man. He taught me. Basically. But he loved butter. <laughs> yeah. He, well, he was doing what he thought the guests wanted. And right then, uh, the purveyor of all our ducks and chickens and eggs uh, came in through this door onto my left. Um, and I immediately just asked, well, I wonder what the implications of what I'm serving has on the the land that it, that's producing it and the farmers mm. that are growing it and the environment that it comes from. And sort of once I, and that was very early on, it was just like the first few months of my serious training. Um, and that sent me down a path of, you know, obscure history of agriculture books and weird policy taxation books. And I stopped reading cookbooks and just started, you know, there were, I can now start to say this, it's crazy, but like there wasn't Kindles or things. So I would pack my bag and my travels uh, through the next five years or so, mostly with books. So you basically spend the, backpacking around with a backpack full of policy and food and ag books. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not cookbooks. Yeah, and I yeah, not cookbooks. And so, um, yeah, so I, that sort of was a, a multi-year journey and ended up coming back to Chicago uh, the year that, just a few months after then Senator Obama had launched his campaign um, to organize chefs around food policy. That was, mm -hmm. I didn't know what I wanted to do much beyond that sentence. Uh, but I knew that chefs had a big role to play and that we weren't raising our voices at all. Uh, yeah. and that was my intent. And then, so the week I got back, got reconnected with, uh, with Michelle, who, you know, was a single mom with not much, I mean, not a single mom, but a working mom with a, a husband who wasn't there. So I'm sure at times she felt like a single mom, uh, and, um, and started helping her a few times a week, uh, as the campaign really got, got going and sort of the rest, the rest was history. Yeah, and then you just went right from the Obama's house in Chicago to the White House. Basically. Uh, oh. There's a lot in between. Obviously, you know, I did a lot to overhaul the their kitchen and how they ate. And she saw the impact not only on herself, but on the well-being of, of the girls. And, you know, we started talking a lot about, you know, just the, just the toll that what we were eating was taking on the health of the nation, on the economy of the nation. Um, and you know, as she started to see the power of what can be done with not that, that huge change, but some real change, um, and how much she had been struggling with that. And, you know, her doctor, her pediatrician had, she talked about this a lot when we were in the white house, but it sort of tapped on her shoulder and said, Hey, you know, they're okay, but they're starting to move in. Their numbers are starting to move in a direction that is concerning. And you should just start taking a little bit of more precaution about what they're eating even though she mm -hmm. thought she was eating them really good food right? yeah yeah um and she realized for somebody who you know is as well educated as her mm -hmm. as you know woman who had plenty of resources if she was struggling with that you know god how how hard is this for parents around the country and so that's really how um we got started down the path that we did
That's pretty amazing. And, and what was it like working in the White House? I mean, that would have been just sort of like a mind-blowing experience, I imagine. Yeah, it was pretty intense. Uh, I had pretty pretty crazy days. I'd start my days. I'd start in the morning. I'd, I'd get a workout in with, with the president and first lady. And then from there, so every day, it was a pretty good way to start the day. And then, um, and then would change into a suit and go work on policy issues and working on Let's Move. So that would be anything from like child nutrition to antibiotics to food safety to working with businesses and trying to get them to change their practices to my plate or all the different things we did. Uh, it was a really broad range of issues around food systems. And then, um, and then you know, oftentimes I'd be caught in some big meeting uh, that would run over and I'd realize like, oh, you know, damn. got to make dinner. <laughs> I got 20 minutes to get dinner on the table and so I'd run through, run sprint to the kitchen, like tear off my, my tie and cook as fast as I can. I, I will say that, you know, I now have two young kids. I have two, two boys under, under three. So my time in the white house really has prepared me well for this because I, <laughs> my, my skills went down over those years. Uh, but I got really fast. Yeah. So I could get dinner on the table in a 20 like, minutes, light speed, no problem. Uh, <laughs> and so it served me well. No. And, and wait, you can make delicious, good food that tastes good and is good for you and isn't going to break the bank in 20 minutes. Absolutely. No yeah. Question. See, that is the myth that the food industry yep. propagates on us, that it's very difficult, that yep. it takes too much time, that it's expensive to eat well. And I think that myth is keeping a lot of American families down. Yep. And it's an interesting moment today in America because everybody has to be home cooking. Restaurants are closed, moment right now. you know, and, and I think people are starting to cook and figure out what to do. But uh, yeah. It's not the time to start making a lot of cakes and cookies because they're going to suppress your immune system. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. So, so, yeah, that's how it happened. Amazing. Hi, everyone. Hope you're enjoying the episode. Before we continue, we have a quick message from Dr. Mark Hyman about his new company, Pharmacy, and their first product, the 10 Day Reset. Hey, it's Dr. Hyman. Do you have FLC? What's FLC? It's when you feel like crap. It's a problem that so many people suffer from and often have no idea that it's not normal or that you can fix it. I mean, you know the feeling. It's when you're super sluggish, your digestion's off, you can't think clearly, or you have brain fog, or you just feel run down. Can you relate? I know most people can. But the real question is what the heck do we do about it? Well, I hate to break the news, but there's no magic bullet. FLC isn't caused by one single thing, so there's not one single solution. However, there is a systems-based approach, a way to tackle the multiple root factors that contribute to FLC. And I call that system the 10-day reset. The 10-day reset combines food, key lifestyle habits, and targeted supplements to address FLC straight on. It's a protocol that I've used with thousands of my community members to help them get their health back on track. It's not a magic bullet. It's not a quick fix. It's a system that works. If you want to learn more and get your health back on track, Click on the button below or visit getpharmacy.com. That's get pharmacy with an F, F-A-R-M-A-C-Y.com. Now back to this week's episode. So, you know, one of the things we really worked on was school nutrition uh, yeah. and the obese. I mean, two out of 10 kids now are obese, not just overweight. Four yeah. out of 10 are overweight. Um, we're seeing this affect their cognitive behavior and academic performance. Uh, what's most striking in the studies that really shocked me uh, was that the ones, the kids who are the most obese are also the most nutrient deficient. Yeah. When you look at their vitamin and mineral levels, they are among the lowest because they're eating crap. Yeah. Uh, and it's affecting their cognitive function, their metabolism, and setting them up for really bad, bad outcomes in lives, lower yeah. life expectancy, lower ability to earn higher incomes. And in schools, it's, it's a cesspool there. Sugar, yeah. salt, processed carbs, industrial refined fats, um, and, and they like, I mean, I, I went to the school, they had, you know, McDonald's Monday, Taco Bell Tuesday, Wendy's Wednesday, they had advertising all over the gymnasiums and bathroom stalls. Yeah. Um, and, and you guys really went to work on this with the Hunger Free Kids Act, the Healthy yep. Hunger Free Kids Act, um, which was signed in law in 2010. Can you tell us about that? And what were the challenges you found that you faced in addressing changes to the school lunch program from the food industry and yep. from the Congress. And, you know, what was that like? <laughs> there are lots of them. Uh, you know, so when we got there, there was no rules at all about what you could sell in schools. So in vending machines and in the a la carte lines and, and the lunch rooms, there was literally zero standards. You could sell anything you wanted. 
Um, and the, new, the, the guidelines had, hadn't been updated in terms of the nutrient standards for the school lunch meal itself in 20 years. And there have been mm-hmm. new resource for the program in 30. Wow. Um, and, you know, part of the challenge, there's lots of different challenges. Uh, one, we were trying to do it in the middle of uh, economic collapse, not too, you know, different from what's happening right now. Um, That's and, right. That was 2008, right? Yeah. And so, you know, it was in, we were working on this in 2000, you know, through 2009. So, um, you know, pretty, pretty intense time to try to get a bill like that done. Um, but, you know, for us in the administration, and it, by the way, it took President Obama intervening and push, helping to push with, with the first lady to get that done. Um, you know, as we think it was the bedrock of the future of the nation. And so that's why it was such a priority for us. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of challenges. One, uh, like on the vending machines, you know, they are huge sources of revenue for things that we care about in schools, like art class and music class, um, the school's budget. Sports. Are, yeah, for sports. So these budgets have been cut so much that schools are depending on basically selling these kids junk food to keep programs that we all care about uh, alive. So there's a real, you know, tense conflict there. Um, uh, but, you know, obviously, you know, killing them or prematurely over the long time, <laughs> is like not a solution for art. So yeah, they can, they can write great poems as they're dying and great can, songs. as they're dying. We, just, we're like, we just have to work. We have to work this out. Um, you know, there's huge raging and sometimes, you know, the debates in Washington just, you know, make leave you scratching your head, but huge debates on whether you had to just offer the vegetable to the kid or actually had to serve them the vegetable. Mm. Uh, well, they talk uh, about competitive foods in schools, which makes yeah. me crazy. I mean, if you, a competitive food is a donut versus an apple. So if you put them side by side, guess which one the kid's going to pick? Yeah. So it's not exactly competitive. <laughs> big, big, big fights there. Um, uh, and you know, then there was a pretty infamous effort by the frozen, uh, food Institute, uh, which is basically the pizza and French fries. Yeah. Um, that got, uh, that made the, the tomato sauce on the pizza to be counted as a vegetable. Yeah. Uh, and French fries, we were working very hard to put limit. We were, we proposed limitations on the amount of fries that could be served in a given week. Uh, Which is also they, vegetable, <laughs> right? Exactly. You, you didn't know. Uh, and uh, ketchup also is a vegetable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, uh, Cong- they got Congress to intervene, and they they they, they, lat- they attached that onto another bill and got that through. So we were able to then increase the serving of vegetables. So you could serve fries, but you still also had to serve like broccoli or something like that. Uh, so it really kind of defeated the purpose of serving the fries. So yeah. we were able to constrain that significantly um, at the time anyway. And so, I mean, I remember a story that, you know, Swanson's Pizza, which is, is a big pizza company in Minnesota, is the largest supplier of pizza to schools. Yeah, they and, are. and Amy Klobuchar, who's the senator mm-hmm. from Minnesota, a Democrat, was instrumental in getting yeah. pizza being included as a vegetable, which yeah. just goes to show you the ways in which the food industry is so influential in driving our policies, which have nothing to do with science. Yeah, that is true. We had big fights on potatoes in many arenas, um, Mm. similar to school lunch as well as with WIC. Um, You know, so, but I got to say, like, so there was real fights. I I, I do think there's this, like, uh, I have gotten over the outrage that industry is going to pursue their interests. I'm sort of just like, we got to get over it and just win and just beat them uh, at their at this game and we need to be smarter and more strategic and get in power run for office get in power and win um so, so you think so, that the congressmen and senators would be your allies did you find that i mean clearly the food industry pushed back yes sometimes they well we got it all passed and the bill was actually quite good um outside of those things that i mentioned you know the whole grain provisions, the sodium provisions, uh, the amount of vegetables we had to serve, like all those things were actually quite very, very strong. There wasn't enough money for the program. Uh, could it be improved? Of course. Could it be significantly mm. improved? Absolutely. But was it just a transformational bill uh, compared to what was there before? Absolutely. So, you know, uh, and it took a Herculean effort to get it done 
at be given everything else that was going on in Washington. So, um, so, you know, look, I mean, I, that was a, just a huge win. And, um, and, and did, was there, was there any follow-up data on how kids did in terms of their weight, their academic performance, the, the impact of the new school lunch guidelines? The, uh, the, I haven't seen a robust uh, analysis for the whole program in its entirety. The other part of the bill that we buried and didn't really talk much about because we didn't look at the target, but maybe the most impactful thing in this bill, I don't know, one you could debate it, was uh, was a provision that basically said, that it's called the Community Eligibility Program, and it allowed schools that had 40% uh, free or reduced, basically where the majority uh, almost the majority of your kids were low-income kids, you could serve breakfast to every kid uh, in the school for free, um, and every kid got lunch for free. And so it was, what, what was, what's very powerful about that is not as much at lunch, but at breakfast, because at lunch, everybody's eating together and you don't know who's who, but breakfast was only in the cafeteria for the poor kids. And so what would happen is, um, those kids would have lunch at school. They'd go home. Most of them don't get food at home when they get there. It may be a lot of bag of chips or something. And then they come back to school, but they were so ashamed of being identified as poor that they would skip breakfast, even though they hadn't eaten since mm. lunch the day. Before. Wow. Um, and so by serving it in the, in the, in breakfast in the classroom, uh, and serving it to everybody, uh, all like millions of poor kids are getting food now that otherwise wow. wouldn't. Um, and so you saw there increased participation, uh, better improved, significantly improved attendance and significantly improved me, uh, reading and math scores. Um, because, you know, with those kids, you know, can you remember when you were like 12 or 13, how hungry you were all the time? Yeah. And imagine you hadn't eaten since, you know, lunch and it's now nine o'clock, the lunch the day before and it's now nine o'clock. And yeah. you're asked to like focus, focus. on the math test. Yeah, forget I mean, it. Just forget that. I could barely do that if I was full, let alone if I was starving. <laughs> right. And so, you know, um, so it was a transformational piece of, of legislation in that regard. And for the, it, the addition that have done, they've seen just incredible results. There's been challenges to implement it, but those resources remain and more and more districts each year are signing up for it. And so the, you know, um, I, I think, I think we have to be careful. Like things um, are messy and politics is messy and you're going to have people lobbying for their, for their own interests or their businesses, sometimes in ways that, you know, I can understand sometimes that I find disgusting and just abhorrent. Can you share some stories of what you experience that, you know, kind of reveal the underbelly of what, what you're fighting against? I mean, look, it cut both ways. I mean, I think, you know, when we were, we banned trans fats, uh, which, uh, you know, there was an attempt to try to figure out from the industry side if, you know, if they could still, because of a few people who wanted various icing and other couple products where, mm-hmm. you know, it was harder to replace. They wanted to, like, go fight uh, to try to allow a certain level right. in under the ban. Am I allowed to swear on this podcast? You can. I, I mean... And I told the lob, the head lobbyist for these guys, like, if you want to have that fucking fight, like, right, let's go, because I cannot wait to take it to you on this. If you want to make sure that you're pumping trans fats, that is a known killer, like, let's go at it. So, yeah. you know, there's people like, that's like clearly something that was killing everybody, a very specific thing that had ample evidence. Um, and sometimes you're just like ready for a nasty fight. But I will also say, and it's important for everybody to understand there's a lot of nuance and a lot of gray. So there's mm-hmm. some issues like pizza in, you know, as a vegetable or trans yeah. fat, where it's just a black and white issue. But there's a lot of other companies that, you know, have done tremendous work to try to make it easier and more affordable for families to get decent food um, that are working in, with real constraints from Wall Street. You know, like if yeah. these CEOs try to change too much too fast and lose some revenue in a three or six month period, they're going to get fired. Right. So there, those efforts are, you know, w- would be undone in a minute. So if you're trying to get somebody to change, there's a pragmatism that has to be taken from them mm-hmm. as well. Um, and by the way, like a lot of people talk about wanting to eat better and how we need better food, but consumers, you know, uh, tend to eat what they eat and tend to like pretty unhealthy food. 
Uh, and well, that's because that food likes them. It's addictive and it sort of sets up the biology that, of that's hunger absolutely. and craving and addiction, which is very hard that, to fight with willpower. And that's part of the problem. That, I told uh, that's absolutely right. But it's also a real problem for the industry. So yeah. they create, they box themselves into a problem of creating, you know, highly craveable food. And now it's there, it's people want it <laughs> and they like yeah. it and they identify themselves with eating it. So it becomes the whole you know, what we eat is really how we understand who we are. Yeah. And so when you start to change, you're saying you want to change me as a human. And so it's, it gets super complicated and people aren't changing as fast as we think they are. And mm-hmm. so for some, for a CEO who's like, I get it. Like my portfolio is not good. I'm <laughs> got to make some real change. It's not like they're in the position to say, I get these products are terrible. I'm just going to get rid of them. Like yeah. it doesn't Well, work. they're innovating. These they're companies consumer. are innovating. They're getting the crap out. They're reformulating their products. They're getting they're- there. They're getting it. So I just, trying. I just think we have to be careful to see like the monolith evil food industry. I agree. Versus everybody because it just actually doesn't capture the reality, nor is it going to go away. And so I think we have to f- work to figure out who's a good actor trying to do the right thing, who's not, and just needs to get called out and pressured and fought and won. Um, mm-hmm. And and then work strategically to make progress. Where, you know, to work collaboratively when you can and fight when you have to. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to have the sniff detector on for the greenwashing. You know what what's Absolutely. true, what's not, and, yeah. and you know, a lot of people are saying the right things. Are they doing the right things? You know, one of the things that's challenging. You know, all the hard work you did with the Obamas to get the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act passed in 2010. Yep. The current administration is trying to roll that back. And their their arguments are that, oh, kids are throwing out the food. It doesn't taste good. People won't eat it. You know, so we have to fix those guidelines, quote, fix the guidelines, and which means roll them back so that more yep. junk can be in the schools. Yep. And, and I, I think, you know, there's a real challenge in the culinary world in school lunches. And as a yep. chef, I'd love your opinion about this because like we were talking about before, you've learned how to make delicious, yummy meals in a short order from ingredients that aren't going to break the bank and that, yeah. and that can be done. And I think there, there are models of this, you know, my friend, Jill Shaw, I think I might've talked to you about her. Yeah. Uh, who's also gonna be on the podcast talking about my way cafe, where she got top chefs to create delicious meals within the school and nutrition guidelines within the school budget for school lunches, yeah. which is not very much. And kids yeah. love it and they're not throwing it out and they're eating it. And I, I've seen this happen over and over throughout the country. So can you speak to the rollbacks that are happening, why they're happening and, and what we can do to fight those? Yeah, well, the main reason they're happening is because of the School Nutrition Association. Uh, and that is an organization whose name they, it does not deserve. Uh, Maybe the School Malnutrition Association? Yeah, <laughs> basically. Um, so basically what's happened with them is, you know, they represent the school chefs, as I call them. Uh, and, and, you know, they've been under a lot of pressure for, for many years. Uh, and, you know, I will say that school chefs around this country have uh, – for the most part, they go uh, into these cafeterias with very little resource, with almost no support. Uh, they love those kids, and they're really trying to do right by them. Mm. Unfortunately, the, the organization that represents them uh, is one that is just dominated by uh, some of the worst players uh, in, in the food system, the, those same pizza and french fries guys, uh, Conagra, and, and, and a few others are the most influential uh, companies are on their board, and they were very supportive of um, of the of Hung- Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act and the work that we were doing, and we were real allies of theirs. And then they realized that this was standards were going too far, and kind of in the middle of the whole thing, they fired the the CEO, uh, brought in a bunch of hacks for uh, big food, and have then since started fighting us. Uh, and um, and now have been lobbying the the Trump administration to roll back uh, these standards. And so, if they're listening, uh, <laughs> I haven't talked to you guys in a while. But shame, shame on you! Uh, it's just a, an abomination uh, of your role in our society to be safeguarding the well-being of the kids that are eating in uh, in our schools and representing and supporting the the people, and mostly women, who are. Mm-hmm. Working so hard with so little support day in and day out to to do the best they can with these resources, and I just am so disappointed um, in how that has played out. Um, you know, the argument that it's just good enough to have some green beans on the line that that's like a serious <laughs> argument for a ten year old to say they want it. It's just a joke. 
right. um, the reality is all the evidence shows that the, 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 the evidence shows two things. One, people, kids have been throwing out school lunch as since the day it was invented. <laughs> and that is nothing new. And there's zero evidence that our new standards led to a, any uh, increased food, food waste. Secondly, the evidence shows that there's a substantial increase in consumption if you actually serve the food to the child. If like you put it on class. their plate. If it's on their plate, they're more <laughs> likely to eat it. <laughs> like, what do you know? Hmm. In fact, that we had to research that, uh, but it's true. It turns out that's, the, that's how it goes. So that's, the, that's where these things really get backward, and they're going to push on to do that, which is, you know, um, you know really troubling, uh, especially given the fact that while we made a tremendous amount of progress, this is a generational effort, and, um, and we have a long way to go, and so we should be tripling down on our efforts, not rolling them back. Um, and as a chef, you believe that, that if we somehow figure it out, how to get food service providers to recalibrate yes. what they're doing that and get, you know, cooks, I mean, getting the ladies and the guys who are in the kitchens and schools actually cooking, yeah, that it's doable. I think, so I think, um, so I think it's doable to, uh, if there was a tremendous increase in funding right now, most of these schools don't, a lot of them don't have real kitchens. Uh, infrastructure is lagging. Schools have been upgraded in years. Schools have way bigger, a big part of the problem for school lunch is that, you know, these school kitchens were designed, cafeterias were designed for like, you know, 300 students. Now there's 700 mm -hmm. uh, in the school. And a big part of the problem that nobody really talks about is like a lot of kids are getting lunch starting like 10 o'clock and then they have like 20 minutes to eat. Yeah. Uh, and they're just not being, they just don't have enough time to eat. Um, so there's a lot of really just structural problems. And so I think there's a middle ground where if we could bring some capacity of cooking back into kitchens or have better sort of hub and spoke models where food is being prepared more fresh and integrating that with high quality sort of pre-made foods, I think that's a, a likely scenario. But you're talking about billions and billions and billions of dollars of infrastructure needs, hundreds of billions. You mean, of you mean kitchens, is that what you mean? Yeah, kitchens and staff. Like now all of a sudden you need a lot more people to cook uh, well, this is when you know uh, Jill Shaw showed that you 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 actually don't increase costs at all. That you can do it if you put the kitchens in and then teach the staff how to do it and create the right recipes with food that's low cost but delicious and nutritious. That it's doable. It, it I'm not saying it's not doable. I'm just saying that uh, it's definitely it's hard. It's and hard. there's some tools that do. It. I'm just saying it takes increased resources. The food costs don't necessarily need to go up. I agree with her. But there's no way she's, I just, and I love her, so I don't want to disagree with her about anything. Uh, <laughs> but there's just, each school is different, so it's hard to speak yeah. in just, you know, general, you know, just complete generalities. But if you have a staff that all they're doing is taking frozen things and heating them up, you have a pretty lean team. Yeah. If you're going to prepare everything and chop every vegetable, uh, then you're just going to need more hands, most likely. Dep now, there could be some things that have a big staff and you could do that, but yeah. for the most part, I think there's some increased costs there, most likely. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a more decentralized, right? It's not a federal program. It's all based on local school districts and everybody right. decides themselves. So it's, it's, it's a harder thing to sort of nationalize, right? Much harder. Yeah, that part is hard. And look, what we found in the restaurant, in, in, oh, sorry, what we found in, in, in these schools is that for the, School chefs who really were excited about, you know, serving better food, passionate about it, really wanted to do right by their kids. They figured out how to make really delicious food uh, within the budget and meeting the standards with, and sometimes dramatically exceeding the standards. And we found that in districts where they didn't believe in it, they didn't care about health, they thought that, you know, these Democrats in, in the White House were, you know, like trying to tell them what to eat. Nanny state. About nanny state. In, they just they serve food that tastes terrible and yeah. so you know a lot of it is just about your will and your commitment to, to yeah. doing well we need to do it because we are destroying our children and the future generation and it's a you know a friend of mine said it was a doctor that was a pediatrician said if we're if if um a foreign nation was doing to our children what we're doing to them we'd go to war to fight it <laughs> you know right, right? right. you know right. all right well you you doing all this work on the front lines of food and politics and you sort of came to a, a revelation about how to make real progress on the challenges facing our health and the planet. Can you talk about what that was? 
uh, a few of them. Which which one? Well, I think you 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 kind of I think you had some insights about working on the front lines that that made you realize um, how to make progress uh, on certain challenges that um, were I think an insight that you got during that work. Oh God, what was I mean? So you probably many, had a lot of them. Yeah, a lot of them. I mean, look, I think. Um, well, I think, you know, for me, change, you know, there's sort of a roadmap for it, but most of it is rooted in, uh, in our culture. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of times we like to blame government. Or we like to think that, you know, there's a very convenient, narr- very convenient narrative that government subsidies are the reason why junk food is cheap. And uh, if only we could change those subsidies, everything would be fine. And we would fix it and healthy yeah. food would be more affordable. Um, and I just came to realize one that's unfortunately just utterly not true. There's no basis in fact of that. Uh, uh, the subsidies are stupid policy. And we actually changed a lot of the ones that people have heard a lot about, but, um, but there is, uh, it's just such a developed market that they're just really a drop in the bucket. Mm-hmm. The reason, the reason why we are eating, um, why junk food is much more affordable than healthier food uh, often is because we've figured out how to make junk food in a very efficient manner and grow the two crops that are really the foundation of unhealthy food, namely corn and soy, in a, in a hyper-efficient manner. I mean, we can have fields of 100,000 acres of corn that nobody ever touches uh, that are planted, grown, and harvested without a single person on the land. Uh, we, the corn used to be f- many feet apart. Now it's grown 18 inches next to each other. It's just an amazing amount of energy and resources that have innovated on the system. And we've you know, invested statistically insignificant, like statistically zero dollars in figuring out how to grow nutrient dense fruit, vegetables, and whole grains um, right. in, in, in that manner. And so we have a, a, just a gaping hole uh, on, on, on our innovation of how we do that. Um, and, and I think that's really where we need to put our attention. Uh, and that's where the solutions are going to really lie. Well, that, that, that brings me to my next question, which is, you know, you worked a lot inside government. And I think you came to the conclusion that, you know, governments may not be the whole answer to solving these problems, that, that businesses have to innovate. And, yeah. and that you have now moved on to working with an organization that focuses on accelerating businesses that are innovating around solutions. So rather yeah. than talk about all the things that go bad and what's <laughs> terrible, how about we talk about what people are actually doing in the innovation space around food and ag yeah. and consumer solutions that yeah. are addressing you know, chronic disease, that are addressing climate change, that are addressing the food system. Yeah. It's so exciting, man. We've had these conversations before, but it'd be really great yeah. to hear how, how actually yeah, you're no, seeing this happen? Yeah, I mean, I, what I what I did realize, and it's just worth a minute to to, to touch on. Um, you know, I think government has a really important role to play in our food system. So it's not to say that it's not a um, you know has a critical role, but it's not that well positioned to change it. Um, there's some key areas like school food, of course, or the military, which we did a bunch of work on, and like the food that the military purchases, and they're huge, obviously. Um, and some other areas where rules and regulations are, are, are quite important in leadership matters. But for the most part, food is a private sector endeavor. And, you know, it's, comp- it's farmers that are growing it and companies that are processing it and, and you know, distributors that are selling it. And, um, and so if we don't affect that, uh, that chain, then we're not going to make much progress. And so I think what we're seeing, if you, we have a food system that's basically been built on a few things, a few key elements. One, uh, we've had the most stable climate in we're kind of recorded history of the last hundred or so years. Yeah, like not anymore. <laughs> been, right. Well, the climate has been completely stable. We've had unlimited natural resources, uh, namely soil and water, just plentiful. Um, and we've had cheap energy. Uh, and it's that, that sort of formulation that has allowed this system that we have currently to be built. And all of those things are done. Um, uh, and so you're seeing a tremendous amount of pressure on the supply chain from all the way upstream down. And you're seeing a transformation in consumer preferences, attitudes, and behaviors being driven around climate and health. Um, and so you're getting a really powerful ecosystem of, 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 uh, of 
the potential for real change because we've seen really no innovation in food systems outside of some things around corn and soy kind of really for the last like 60, 70 years. If you think about like, think about your kitchen is a good way to uh, think about it in, in a way that we can touch. The only innovation in the kitchen has been the microwave over the last like 75 years, 50 years or something like that. Yeah. Right. Like once we have a refrigerator, that was a big deal. Uh, we've had ovens. They've gotten better, but they're Instapot. basically the same. <laughs> Instapot, yeah. yeah. I got crushed by it. I've dropped my cookbook and there's like two Instapot cookbooks and it's like, I got buried by Instapot. Man. <laughs> I was like, what is this Instapot thing? And it turns out I was like living in the dark. <laughs> um, yeah, Instapot in the microwave. This is about, I like hats off. That's great. You know, the microwave, <laughs> but the microwave, if you stop and think about it, was kind of the only real innovation that we've seen it, you know, the rest of our world is being transformed by our phones and everything is changing. Mm, with technology standpoint. But, and that's true throughout the whole supply chain. Um, and, and so the time is ripe. So you have all these young entrepreneurs who are founding businesses to try to solve the issues of food and climate. Uh, to try to solve the issues uh, around our health and our well-being. And this goes all the way up from like genetics of plants uh, to different ways of bringing uh, nutrients to the soil, the microbiome of the soil, all the way to how do we trace and provide transparency and th through the supply chain, alternative mm. proteins, alternative ingredients, and then you know down into the convergence of the healthcare system and the food system. Finally, there's a, a major part of the economy that is – waking up to the realization that if they don't help make a healthier country, they're going to go out of business. I mean, yeah. the tidal wave, you know, the tidal wave of just diabetes alone, 34 million pre-diabetics and over 80 million, di uh, 34 million diabetics and over 80 million pre-diabetics. It's just a tidal wave of health of a healthcare crisis coming at, at the industry. And so there's just all this innovation coming, but how do we deliver more nutrient dense foods in a price point that, people can afford and and i think there's uh it gives me a lot of hope now we're running out the clock is ticking we're running out of time the problems are particularly on the climate side are happening faster than i think anybody uh could have realized i i didn't know if i told you this you know i do these dinners called the last supper where <laughs> i would cook I'm, i do these i still do it sometimes where I, you take ingredients that um uh basically experts are predicting that our kids or grandkids aren't going to have because of climate. So these are things like coffee and wine and chocolate. So let me just repeat that coffee, wine, chocolate. So we're not going to be able to eat those. <laughs> so now everybody's got a stake in solving climate change if they didn't realize it before. Uh, but it's also like shellfish and crustaceans and crabs, so crabs and lobsters and the, you know, real food, you know, base, base bedrocks of the, you know, ocean, uh, nuts and banana, all kinds of different, uh, different foods. And then, you know, I, a couple of weeks ago, uh, got a, a, a little push alert around, you know, basically Dungeness crabs are populations have collapsed because the acidification of the ocean, which we thought was going to happen in 20, 30, 40 years, yeah, is increasing so fast that they're not, the babies can't form shells. And so they're starting to get wiped out. Um, you know, so the things that I was, you know, had been talking about up until like a couple of months ago that were like way off in the future, but like in our kids it's and accelerating. grandkids. Are happening now so um you know i think the sense of urgency to change how we're eating uh and to um and to innovate is is growing ever ever more dire yeah so um what's really interesting is that uh, we talk about how the way we grow food is going to be threatened by climate change so in a, in a way the way we're growing food contributes to climate change and the food that we're trying to grow is going to be impacted by climate change. Can you talk about that and what, what innovations are happening in technology that's going to be necessary to actually make progress on both those aspects? Yeah, it's a pretty negative feedback loop that we're under right now. You know, food and ag is the number two driver of emissions globally. And, you know, give or take a decade, the next 20 or 30 years, it's going to be the number one driver because unlike energy, where we can see a future where our footprint is coming down, food and ag is going straight up. Um, yeah. Some estimate and, that it even now, when you add it all in, it's the first. You you add it all, depending on how you cut the numbers. Yeah. I think you can make a good argument. But either way, it's a huge part of the footprint. Um, and, and, you know, and it's a wildly inefficient system. We're wasting a, a third of what we produce, which is a huge emitter in and of itself. 
Um, and we're getting these terrible, we're waste, terrible health outcomes. Um, so it's a system that is wildly inefficient. Um, and as the climate gets worse, food and, is, and food security is on the front line. It's one of the places where we're going to feel the impacts of climate first, and we already are. Um, uh, and what, so what you're starting to see is... Because with climate instability, then you, the agricultural environments change, and you can't grow the food that you used to be able to grow where you used to grow it. Yeah, so what we're starting to see, I'm actually, uh, uh, um, you beat me to the punch with your incredible book, but I'm, I'm, I'm writing a, you know, say a different version of the same issues that we've got to talk about. You're just, you're just faster than me, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> you've been busy, um, you've been busy. You have the babies and all yeah, that. I, 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 I did the babies. I get blame it on the kids. I get blame it on the kids. Uh, but I'm working on, you know, what I'm working on right now is you, you actually, what you're seeing is a, a massive migration north of plants and animals, uh, uh, north and south, trying mm -hmm. to get to more temperate climates because the volatility and increasing temperatures are making the areas where we grew food, in, you know, inhospitable. Now, there's some areas for a time being that will benefit, right? Uh, but um, all those but, soils are different in the north if you're growing, you know food and, in North Dakota and you want to go grow it in Northern Saskatchewan, it might not be the same. And we're going to run out of room. <laughs> like mm -hmm. uh, we're, you know, and so you're seeing this just real disruption and there's some, you know, plants that can move, you know, they're planted year over year. So they can, you know, move as the climate moves and farmers realize, Oh, I can plant corn now. Like they're going to plant it for a while because they can make some real money, but there's other crops like anything that grows on a tree that's not as easily moved. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, for fishermen who have been fishing certain areas for generations, uh, you know, when the fish are gone, there's nothing to catch. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, remember, I remember going to North Newfoundland, uh, which was one of the biggest cod fisheries in the world. Yeah. And we went to this remote little bay. We had to literally take a boat around to this town that was isolated. And there was yeah. this incredible fish hatchery, this giant fish, I mean, uh, processing plant. And uh, there were a couple of fishermen on the dock in they brought in these really puny little cot and it was yeah. just so sad. And the whole town was like going out of business sale. Everything was shutting down and it was just sort of, you know, firsthand experience of what actually is going on. Yep. Yeah. It's pretty devastating. And so we're just at the very beginnings of this. Uh, and so, you know, I think we're going to have to, you know, and so look, I think that we're going to have to use, we're going to have to innovate in, in meaningful ways. And sometimes in uncomfortable ways. And, and, you know, we don't really like the idea of high tech things in our food and we shouldn't, you know, I think that sort of sense of, you know, tradition and that sense of, you know, this is how we've always done it is, is a, is a healthy, there's a healthy aspect to that. Um, but given, you know, what's happening and how bad I think it's going to get and how bad I think it's going to get in a relatively short amount of time, um, that I think we're going to have to keep an open mind about looking at different tools that could help us solve these challenges. Mm. What are you seeing coming up in these businesses that you're looking at? Like what are, you're sort of sitting I think in the biggest, I think the biggest one that is both has the biggest potential to help, uh, help us manage the, the crisis that we're entering as well as has potential to be used in all kinds of ways that could not be beneficial is gene editing. Um, and uh, just like you, you know, kind of hear, you hear a lot about it right now around human health um, and sort of designer babies and all those sort of things. Um, that same sort of technology can be used to basically express or silence genetic material in the genome of a plant, not, not foreign DNA, but uh, what's currently resides in a- This is not literally genetically modified organisms in the sense of inserting like a bacterial gene in a plant or- Right. Something like that. It's, yeah, it's, GMO. It's, GMO is as it exists now, uh, and as you hear it, is about foreign DNA being inserted into the genome of a plant. CRISPR, what it does is it allows you to both silence genes that are being expressed or express genes, more importantly, that have been silenced and kind of lost over like, you know, thousands, hundreds of years, if not thousands of years of breeding. So the power of the, and to do multiple expressions or silencing in one plant, mm -hmm. um, it has transformational potential. Uh, in terms Give me an example of how that would be used uh, in agriculture. You could use it. You could use it to improve. So, like wheat has a lot of fungus problems. You could use it to 
help uh, target the genes that could be resistant to fungus while increasing the fiber in the plant and improving nutrient density potentially. Yeah. Or, or needing, allowing it to be more drought tolerant. Mm. Uh, you can do things. You can breed it for more nutrient density and flavor, which would always be good. Flavor. <laughs> Absolutely. Like their ability to basically target, sequence the, the, the genome of a plant, target the characteristics of that plant you want or silence the ones you don't is just a much cheaper now and much, much more efficient. Now, the question is like, what are the values that we're going to deploy these tools on? They're very powerful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think instead of saying tool, like genetics bad, which is just not how we, you know, it's really not been the case. We've been tinkering with the genetics of plants since yeah. the beginning. Gregor Mendel. <laughs> right. Well, and far before him, far before I mean, him, for sure. It's the foundation of society, of civilization was our ability yeah. to take plants and breed them over time. This is able to do that in a much more uh, dramatic and efficient manner. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is, are we going to use these tools for the benefit of a few big companies so they get to spray more chemicals uh, and extract more profit? Mm -hmm. Or are we going to use this in a way that's going to help lighten our footprint uh, uh, on the agricultural system and improve the health outcomes of eaters? And I, you know, so the, where I've come to after, you know, grappling and there's going to be a lot of gray and it's going to be, I think, complicated, but I, you know, I'm going to judge these new innovations based on that. So mm. I don't think tools are inherently good or bad. I think it's how you use them. And, um, and so, you know, that's how I think we need to see this. So if it's helping us meet these goals of a much more uh, sustainable, sustainable and healthier food system, then I support it. And if not, then I don't. Amazing. That's a simple metric to look at. <laughs> Is it helping or hurting? <laughs> yeah. And there's a lot of things that are hurting. So, um, yeah. So, so as individuals, what can we do to shift our patterns? And is that even relevant? I mean, do we have to wait for business and governments to act? Or can we as individuals actually make a difference to live a way that's more healthful and more climate smart? Oh, there's no question about it. Uh, you've written about it in many of your books. I, I took my stab at it in my cookbook, uh, hybrid <laughs> cookbook. You know, I think there's no question that, um, uh, you know, we, here's the thing that people don't realize. And this is true of both politicians and of businesses. They're scared to death of us. They spend hundreds of millions of dollars trying to figure out what we're thinking, what do we want, and just figuring out how they can somehow deliver it in some way, shape, or form. Like, they feel powerful, and they are, and they'll fight for things when their interests are friends, but they're scared. Yeah. And they're listening intently to everything, like every micro trend. They're like, oh, my God, I think they may be going this way. We got to figure out how to, you know, move that way. Um, yeah. And we're driving so much uh, of their behavior, and we're more powerful than we realize. Yeah, they'll see the CBD Coca-Cola, I'm sure. <laughs> of course. That's right. I guarantee it. I guarantee <laughs> that. And think about that. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, we have to – the key for us and the way I always, you know, try to, try to put this out there is – you know, I think we need to set ourselves up for success. We need to make it as easy on ourselves as we can to make the best choice. Because a lot of times we're buying food that's pretty unhealthy and then just trying to rely on willpower to just not eat it in our home. And like, no matter who you are, if that cookie is in front of you, eventually you're going to eat it. Like yeah. you can hold off for a while, but there's nobody, myself included, who is not eventually going to eat a cookie if it's there. Yeah, and a lot of times, and this is how marketing works. And I know See, you now know, you made me want to cook chocolate chip cookies tonight after dinner. I'm <laughs> exactly, like, oh but god, that's exactly how it works. <laughs> that's exactly how marketing works. And you've talked a lot about this, but you know, it's such a bad. You're like driving home, you see a picture of a burger, or you hear somebody say chocolate chip cookie, and then you're like, oh, I would love a cookie. It's like you didn't want a cookie; you just saw a picture of a cookie, uh -huh. and that made you want the cookie. Yeah. Uh, and so <laughs> in our home, especially, I think we have to do a much better job at you know, fighting the fight in the grocery store, like being really conscious about making good choices there. Hmm. And then relaxing when we get home because we have ourselves surrounded by things that are good for us. And, and if yeah. we continue to do that um, and focus on just, you know, more plants, nutrient dense, you know, fruits, vegetables, nuts, whole grains, um, we're going to continue to drive the market and, and make that known, you know, make that known to your friends, make that known to your family, make that known on social media. That has a huge impact on our culture. And as, that becomes our norm, you're going to see both policy and politics uh, and food companies starting to try to increasingly respond 
to uh, what we're saying we want and what we're saying we need and what we're saying we're going to do and doing. Well, and that for me is, enough. yeah, that for me is, 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 is actually the main job. Like that's the hard work, but that's the work that actually allows both the industry and, and our, and our policy and politics to, uh, to act as they should, because they're supposed to follow us. These people aren't leaders. Business people are not leaders. No. <laughs> Politicians are not leaders. They're not. They're designed. They're supposed to follow. Democracy yeah. is about following the will of the people. That's what they're supposed to do. And so it really, like, we have more power in this than we realize. And so I think we, the more we activate on that, the better we're going to be. I think that's true. And I think that the take-home message is make your home a safe zone. Yeah. You know, don't introduce foods in there that are not good for you, your family and introduce foods that taste good and are amazing. I mean, my, my son, when he was, uh, I think 15 or 14, he wanted a bunch of, invite a bunch of friends over for dinner. He goes, there's nothing to eat in the house. I'm like, all right. I said, let's go to the grocery store. And uh, there's only one rule. You can't buy anything with trans fat, period, nothing. Yeah. He couldn't find a single thing to buy, pizza, yeah. whatever you want to buy, yeah. all had trans fat. <laughs> yeah, totally. And it was a good lesson, you know, and I think. Yeah, I mean, look, we, uh, I think a real rule on that is, too, when you get into your home, it's true in society. You eat what you see. Like, that's right. That's what you're going to eat. And so even in your home, it's not to say that you shouldn't have a, like a, you know, if you want a couple cookies. I got really chocolate. Want, yeah. And just coffee put it and wine. Out of sight. Just put, <laughs> I got plenty of wine, especially right now. Let me tell you. Uh, <laughs> but just put it out of sight, you know, put it on the top shelf behind something. So you're only going to eat it when you like, know you really, really want it. Mm -hmm. um, and what, and this is honestly what I, what happened. This is how it all started with the Obamas is that instinctually, and I didn't even know the, the research that had been done at that time, but you know, I took the fruit that was in the bottom shelf, which we, you know, everything goes to waste down there. Why? Because like, we don't see it. So we open the fridge, we don't open it. We don't see what's down there. And then you remember, mm. oh man, I should look down there. And it's like, God, yeah, we got know, green beans tonight because uh, we found them in the bottom. Our, our <laughs> right. But, you know, I put the fruit out on the counter. So when the girls would run by, if I had a bowl of chips there, they would have grabbed a bowl of chips, a handful of chips. But I had some grapes there, so they grabbed grapes, right? Mm -hmm. It's just because that's what was easy and that's what they saw. And so the more you can surround yourself with those things, so you're not having to think about it and you're just eating whatever's around you, the better, the, like the more successful we're going to be um, because we're going to eat what we see. So just think about that, like, about setting up what 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 you're gonna make eye contact with as yeah. you move through your day, it's gonna have a huge impact on ultimately what you eat, even in our homes. Yeah, and no, I love what Michael Pond says: if you want to eat something, just eat it, but make it yourself. If you want French fries, make them yourself. Yeah. <laughs> if you want a cookie, make it yourself from real yeah. ingredients. <laughs> and you yeah. know, well, well, also like, yeah, the the because the the truth that that's true mostly because like we would never put as much of the junk in there as like these guys would right because they're they're trying to manip, maximize the profit margins on every product if you're gonna you know cook something you're not gonna like throw like 10 times the amount of sugar right and some extra acid and some salt just to amp the whole thing up yeah um and not have any real good other ingredients that actually carry the flavor okay so, well yeah, i'm gonna go is one of those great solves for all of that Okay, well, this week I'm going to make French fries uh, from scratch uh, <laughs> with some beef tallow, just like the old McDonald's French fries. And I might make some chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> but I'm trying, to, I'm, I'm trying to eat healthy. And I, I think all of us should, should uh, you know, keep our homes safe from industrial food. If we did that, it would be a game changer. Uh, you, know, be, you know, if you just, and, and I did this when I was, my kids were growing up. There were two things on the menu, take it or leave it. <laughs> you know, that was yeah, it. I love it. And, yeah. and, uh, they did fine. And my son's now a chef, my daughter cooks and they eat delicious food and they understand it. And they, they went off the wagon for a little bit, but, uh, but they, they had it embedded in their consciousness when they were growing up and that's what they loved. And, and I think we can all do that for our families and that's the place to start. And what that does, like you said, Sam, it drives the marketplace, it drives innovation, it drives policy. So, so that's what we can all do. Uh, and I, and I really, uh, applied your efforts, uh, both on the political front and fighting the good fight, which was not easy. I'm sure you got a lot of battle wounds and, and now, uh, you know, thinking about how do we stimulate business and innovation in food and agriculture to actually solve some of these big problems. So my hat's off to you, Sam. Thank you for joining us on the doctor's pharmacy. Uh, such a pleasure being here. And, you know, thank you for all of your incredible leadership and advocacy over the years. You're like a one man army with a much bigger army behind you and so you know we just uh you've had such an impact and just it's just an honor to be here with you
Well, thanks, Sam. So uh, if you've been listening to Doctor's Pharmacy and you love this podcast, please share it with your friends and family. Leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And we'll see you next week on the Doctor's Pharmacy. Thank you.